our schedule. I'm happy to announce that our second section is starting now. And the section is entitled Robotic Signal Processing, Urban Planning and Network Security. And Olena Ivana will be opening this section with topic effects of signal processing and machine learning algorithms on decoding brain machine interfaces. Lana, stage is yours, please. Glory to Jesus Christ. Uh, dear committee, uh, dear students, let me introduce my uh, project on uh, researching the effects of signal processing and machine learning algorithms on decoding brain machine interfaces. Uh, this work has been inspired by Dr. Brokoslav Lashovsky, who is a research scientist in Toronto Rehab Reha Rehabilitation Institute and head of Bionics Laboratory in the University of Toronto. And uh, the speech will be as follows. So the first part will be motivation. And um, then I will share you the outcomes of uh, related work analysis, research gap, and uh, we will discuss research questions and problem. And I'll show you the planned approach to solution and uh, evaluation objective plan, early results and preliminary conclusions. And uh, Brain machine interface starts with the signal source. And for brain machine interface, the signal source is uh, brain itself. And um, in this field, um, uh, most uh, studied be my protocol is a motor imaginary. Um, what is this? When uh, you uh, move in, uh, so the scientists discover, so when you perform some movement of your body uh, and uh, the image uh, of uh, highlighted uh, brain parts are the same as when person uh, doesn't do anything but just imagining this movement. And this is phenomena called uh, um, brain synchronization and desynchronization. And uh, uh, this is a source of information about uh, body movement. And the uh, completed scheme of brain machine interface uh, is a is a closed loop of learning and interaction everything starts with uh, motor imaginary when person imagining some movement uh, then uh, electrodes uh, measures the signals and uh, we call uh, the signals uh, uh, electroencephalography signals and then those signals uh, 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 decoded by real-time neural decoder and uh, basically it consists in three uh, parts it's a data processing feature extraction and machine learning classifier um, and then the decoded signal uh, goes to exoskeleton or bionic leg and uh, perform movement and this uh, movement then goes as a, a sensory feedback to people uh, to person and um, in this scheme um, we have these two learners person as a motor learner and machine as a <laughs> machine learning um, uh, EEG signals are really complex, uh, high dim dimensional and non-stationary and uh, have low signal to noise ratio uh, in the temporal domain, really hard to decode signal. And the uh, research goal is to improve this EEG decoding of leg movement uh, by defining the best combination of signal processing and machine learning algorithms in terms of, of accuracy f1 score in terms of classification performance uh, we performed um, uh, related work analysis and um, uh, in uh, three dimensions it's a uh, signal processing feature extraction and classification and for signal processes uh, 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 science community adopted three main uh, approaches. It's a uh, channel selection, artifacts removal, and increasing signals to noise ratio. And uh, <clears throat> most commonly used methods, it's uh, regression methods, blind source separation, filtering methods, wavelet transform. For 
feature extraction, uh, what they usually do, they um, divided um, EEG signals to different frequency bands, uh, uh, adopt dimensionality reduction techniques, and uh, represent data in different domain, like time frequency and non-linear space domain. And um, the uh, principal component analysis, uh, uh, fast Fourier transform, common special patterns, uh, uh, commonly used uh, algorithms for uh, feature extraction and also survival transform. And for classification uh, algorithms, uh, it's uh, also uh, we can divide uh, the algorithms to <clears throat> deep learning algorithms and classical machine learning algorithms. And uh, for deep learning algorithms, uh, they use the convolutional neural network and uh, recurrent neural network, and widely use uh, the classical machine learning algorithms uh, as a support vector machine, uh, linear discriminant analysis, random forest, and uh, others. And um, when uh, I did uh, uh, literature review, I applied a uh, snowball method. It's an automatic pipeline for a terminological saturation. And the side, uh, the side product of this algorithm is the uh, terms uh, and uh, terms of the corpus of document. And I used these terms of uh, documents to do correlation analysis to understand how these terms correlate with each other. And I found a pretty interesting finding that, uh, first of all, uh, for feature extraction, so the, mm, uh, the emphasis on uh, signal processing, signal processing rather than feature extraction uh, used for lower limb uh, BMIs. Then uh, term narrow robotic has uh, high negative correlation with deep learning. I have the explanation. Uh, it's because uh, this particular topic for gait, for lower limbs, uh, 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 become uh, highly popular. And uh, if we search for articles in this year, last year, we will find more deep learning uh, approaches than uh, in past years. And uh, term uh, deep learning uh, uh, by itself has high positive correlation with feature structures, but uh, have uh, have no correlation or low, really low correlation with signal processing. And all these findings give me uh, source for my research. And um, wow, uh, I have uh, two research questions. And uh, the first research question is uh, what combination of signal processing, feature extraction, and classification algorithm can improve the performance of EG decoding of lower leaf movements and uh, including walking? And uh, the second question is how does combination um, with the highest accuracy differ between classification tasks? Uh, here I showed two types of uh, uh, classification tasks uh, it's, uh, for example, uh, when person sit, stand, or walk, it's a kind of high-level uh, classification task. It's a general um, uh, body stage, uh, states. And if you talk about uh, uh, foot movement, uh, it's a more... Uh, um, um, it's a low-level le low tasks, like... Uh, for example, movement of food and uh, phases of gait. And uh, I can uh, describe the research problem as uh, uh, we would like to perform a systematic comparison of signal processing and feature extraction algorithms with different classifiers on several data sets uh, with two types of classification tasks and multiple uh, subjects. Uh, and um, anal after analyzing the papers, uh, I found that uh, found um, uh, for um, commonly used signal processing algorithms, it's a H infinity denoising algorithm, um, fully automated statistical thresholding for EG artifact rejection, artifacts of space reconstruction, and surface Laplacian filter. Uh, you can meet them in almost uh, all your paper. Uh, for brain machine interface decoding. And for feature extraction, we can adopt uh, discrete wavelet transform, uh, filter bank, common special patterns, 
independent component analysis and multiple entropy fusion features. And for classification algorithm, we uh, selected convolutional neural network, uh, long short term, term memory, support vector machine and linear discriminant analysis. And um, we selected two uh, sets of tasks, as I described it earlier, uh, and for lower, uh, lower level tasks, we can uh, classify a right foot strike, left foot strike, right foot off, left foot off, just walking phases. And um, we uh, uh, did the research on uh, open source data, uh, data sets, and we found six data sets uh, useful for this approach. Uh, and it's covered 19 subjects, actually. And for performance evaluation, we can uh, calculate uh, classification performance and uh, computation performance. And uh, we can uh, measure F1 score, accuracy, precision, recall, and for computational performance, it might be training time, memory usage, inference time. So I would like to present uh, the early results for this uh, thesis, uh, for this, uh, the thesis project, uh, we selected two signal processing algorithms, two feature extraction algorithms, and uh, applied uh, all four um, classifiers and selected this low-level uh, classification tasks. And we have already uh, have the results for seven subjects from one data set. And what is the data set? Uh, the data was collected during the research of uh, uh, gate-related artifacts in mobile EEG recording. And uh, they actually measured uh, lots of different uh, tasks, but they had um, uh, uh, they have uh, they had uh, data about stages of uh, gate and uh, about the food, uh, and they um, used fit uh, acceleration. Uh, they measured uh, fit acceleration with two 3D uh, accelerometers attached to the tops of uh, participant shoes, shoes. So the data pretty much uh, uh, correct. Um, yes. And um, the, this slide is about data preprocessing. Uh, I selected the 25 electrodes that cover uh, motor, uh, uh, motor part of uh, low uh, lower limb uh, part of brain. And uh, uh, I divided the data set to chunks because it's time series data and uh, it appeared that the common approach is to apply rolling window approach, uh, fixed rolling window and um, assign a class to the whole, to the whole chunk uh, by the last uh, timestamp. Uh, so, and um, uh, to my data, so each, uh, each subject uh, have about 15 minutes of data, and I used two last uh, minutes as a testing data. And uh, uh, this is the distribution of uh, subject uh, of classes of uh, for, for subjects from training from training data. Um, uh, yes, and uh, for baseline, uh, I applied uh, standard scaling to the data and removed re uh, related artifacts with ECA and filtered uh, data between uh, and, and filtered data removed unnecessary frequencies. And uh, this is how my uh, pipeline uh, looks. Uh, so, uh, as you can see, uh, the the total number of experiments per, per one person is 36 experiments. How I uh, obtained this result? So I have four classifiers per three signal processing steps. Uh, none is uh, none is just normalized data, and it gives me uh, 12 experiments. And then if uh, I use uh, three feature extraction methods, uh, none is non-feature extraction at all. Uh, I'll have uh, 36 experiments. Uh, and uh, for, for seven subjects, it is uh, 252 experiments. It's a pretty <laughs> much big number. And um, I'll uh, 
uh, uh, I'll talk a bit about signal processing um, techniques and feature extraction techniques I used. So the uh, artifacts of space reconstruction, basically it's an automatic approach to remove uh, high power uh, artifacts. It uh, use a statistical approach and requires uh, calibration, clean calibration data. And then uh, when you clean uh, the data with uh, uh, with the weights obtained from calibration, it just uh, uh, use threshold to reject uh, unnecessary components. And uh, signal uh, surface Laplacian filter really interesting algorithm. I never heard about uh, them, uh, it uh, before working with EEG signal. And uh, it uh, what uh, it uh, do? It uh, remove. Uh, low uh, frequency uh, signal that uh, comes from uh, deep uh, uh, deep layers of brain and focuses on uh, local correlations and uh, at this image you can see that the first image with a blue hat uh, is basically the same the same uh, the same data the same uh, person. But if you perform a Laplacian filter, you will have the uh, uh, local uh, activity on uh, the near surface of brain. It's a bit uh, clearer. And uh, uh, independent component analysis, it's a pretty good blind source separation, blind source separation technique, uh, how widely used in machine learning. And uh, the next is a common special patterns also used in EG. And um, uh, it's, it requires, um, so it's uh, to find these common special uh, filters. Uh, you have to divide your data by classes and then uh, solve, uh, so perform uh, I go, it's a general uh, eigen decomposition problem, and uh, you will have your uh, filters for each class. And actually, uh, it's a kind kind of tricky algorithm because it was developed for two uh, binary classification. But I have four classes, and as it is, uh, uh, you can imagine. So if if I have um, filters for each class i'll at the end uh, when i apply them i'll have so many features so i uh, i had to do a feature selection stage mm -hmm. and um, for uh, the first model it's a uh, for a convolutional neural network i selected eg net it's pretty uh, common widely citated uh, neural network and uh, it's widely used in e e eg community and here is the result for my seventh subject. And uh, it's a F1 score. And from this table, you, uh, you can, we can see that uh, application of surface Laplacian filter and independent component analysis give, gives high accuracy uh, in combination with uh, this convolutional neural network. And uh, uh, it's a confusion matrices for the highest results. And um, uh, the first is a uh, data normalization, just to normalize data, uh, and the second is for uh, independent component analysis. And even here, we can see the uh, how independent component analysis highlights main components. And I think I'm not uh, uh, kind of neuroscientist, but uh, I can say that this person is a right-handed person. Uh, uh, so. And surface Laplacian um, highlights more, uh, uh, some features uh, better, so we have uh, better results. So LSTM model. Actually, I um, found this uh, model uh, from paper which, which also focused on a lower uh, limb movement decoding. And it's pretty simple uh, neural network. It has only two LSTM layers. And it's it's pretty simple for this task. Uh, I think if uh, scientists uh, really apply neural uh, LSTM neural network, uh, they don't use just a clean uh, LSTM uh, neural network. Uh, it also I, I saw many uh, works that applied uh, some uh, some convolutions, even one D convolutions and two two D convolutions. Uh, uh, so the uh, they apply also convolutions with uh, recurrent neural network. But for 
a testing uh, purpose, I take uh, this one. So uh, also uh, for LSTM uh, model, uh, artifact subspace reconstruction and independent component analysis added to inverse F1 score. So it's also useful for this model. Then uh, for linear discriminant analysis, uh, I also found um, a good influence of uh, artifacts of space reconstruction and independent component analysis. But I, I had pretty interesting result for support vector machine. Uh, it seems like uh, the uh, the uh, just normalize the data was enough to get highest results from this model. Um, uh, I will do, I will uh, search on this uh, better because uh, it seems like uh, this uh, same numbers uh, in the columns uh, looks pretty strange, even though the data are different. And the pre preliminary conclusion is that also it's generally accepted that neural networks uh, as universal or appro approximators are capable of understanding raw, data, raw input data uh, without any signal preprocessing. The results show that actually signal processing and future extraction can improve decoding, uh, uh, can improve EG decoding accuracy for neural networks. And the next step uh, for this master thesis project, I'll finish my experiments for eight subjects and apply uh, other metrics uh, for um, accuracy estimation and uh, uh, summarize the, per the computing performance metric because I didn't show it there and uh, draw a conclusion about influence one algorithms or another during processing. Uh, and uh, I expect to do scientific uh, publication, and for this uh, scientific publication, uh, I'm going to finish all the um, stated uh, algorithms and uh, that data sets and uh, all the subjects. And uh, I had a question from a reviewer, and uh, he, the reviewer asked me, why EG signal? Why uh, not uh, signals from muscles? And uh, there, there, there is an answer, there's many people who has injured spinal cord and have paralyzed the lower uh, uh, body and they have only brain to to work with so it's a good point to start the, the research and um, potential of eg for brain machine interfaces uh, thank you for your attention we'll be happy to hear your questions Thank you so much for the presentation. Are there any questions? Well, there are many questions. Let's start from Ihor and then. Yeah, thank you for uh, your talk. So I have like a couple of questions. So the first one, uh, could you please go to the motivation slide? So you had their picture where you had uh, yes. the person with the in-cranial uh, electrodes. Yeah. So my question is the next one. I think that this is really important and it's really practical work. and But at the same time, intracranial electrodes are not practical and no one will wear the hat with the electrodes under his bone, under his skull. So how do you think how your approach like will perform if the electrodes will be on the top of the head and like would it be still good results or it, the efficiency will fall down i i agree that those uh, electrodes on head uh, seems like at least strange and uh, the current uh, implementation of these headsets um uh, requires uh, wires and having uh, the ampli amplifier and battery for it and they wear uh, them in backpack and uh, but i think uh, while we don't have a widely used neural link as elon musk developed uh, the, those electrodes put inside uh, our brain so it seems like uh, so the power of this uh, EEG recording is in the number of uh, electrodes covered the brain. So the many we have, the best uh, signal we are measuring. But uh, it seems like we 
now we can't avoid uh, wearing this hat <laughs> and how it's how it yeah, works. Yeah, I see. So basically, the strength of the signals from the top, uh, it, it's not enough to understand the muscular activity. Uh, I think uh, if we want to reconstruct the movements of uh, fingers, I think no, because it's a really low level mm -hmm. task. Okay. But if you just move in your leg and stand in, uh, without uh, this high level uh, uh, potential, you wouldn't. You you. It, it's. I think it's. It will be pretty hard to tell whether the person want to walk or want to just stand and move. Um, it's like. Got it. Okay. So uh, my next question would be regarding the uh, neural networks configuration. So you were saying that you have uh, CNN and you have LSTM. So yes. CNN could be 1D, 2D. Uh, what's the input for the CNN? And like it's 1D on top of the signal, 2D oh. on top of the, top the uh, channel of signals or 2D on top of the spectrogram. Uh, um, for this, uh, for my uh, pipeline, actually all the uh, feature processing algorithm return the reconstructed signal. So if I have 25 electrodes and data from 25 electrodes, then I received 25 electrodes and data from those electrodes. And uh, EEG net uh, takes uh, this 2D image, uh, 25 uh, electrodes per 100 points. So it's kind of it's a 2D image for the yeah, net. I, I, I got it. Would it be better maybe to like to pre-process it and to process the spectrogram or male spectrogram or something like this, like uh, to have like better representation where we have like the frequency uh, represented in a better way. Uh, yes, uh, it uh, will be the, um, researched in uh, next steps. So we will going to adapt uh, uh, the dis uh, discrete violet transform to. Uh, adopt to, to retrieve those spectrograms. Uh, and do you have like idea what kind of um, uh, other function you will apply in wavelets or just like just no, I, I, okay, got I, it. I, I, uh, so and my, my last question here uh, would be so you were using LSTM, yeah, that's correct. So uh, there's plenty of recurrent neural networks like RNN, LSTM, mm -hmm. gated current unit, you have transformer. Uh, they have different applications yes. like what do, why do you think the lstm would be better like from my point of view like the muscular activity is quite short range so it's not the, the long and for yes. this we could go with uh, a regular rnn and not to go with like something more sophisticated like what's the benefits of applying uh, lstm here it's a really good point because uh, if uh, we compare to tables the results from uh, convolutional neural network and LSTM, uh, we have we will see the huge difference because uh, I have pretty bad results from uh, this convolutional neural network and uh, I think this is the reason of uh, those bad results. It's the model itself, but uh, in my uh, the main focus of my research, it's um, <clears throat> it's uh, understand what can help uh, what signal processes can help uh, and work for those models and i'm pretty sure maybe uh, i just need to found a better model or even not to use lstm but uh, for me uh, if i i see the increase in accuracy uh, for this model i will I suppose I will see this increase in accuracy for um, uh, the other uh, recurrent neural network. Thank you a lot. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for your presentation. So I had a question about CNN, but you already verified that. Uh, can you, yeah, I, I kind of already understand about it, but uh, can you please explain, show one of the tables with the accuracy and... Uh, so F1 just... F1 score. F1 Wait score. It. Okay. Wait it. And so how should it be read? You just move quite quickly. Uh, so, so it's a... Uh, I used a combination with signal processing and feature extraction and uh, algorithms, uh, separate algorithms itself. So the first column, it's artifacts of space reconstruction with common special patterns. Um, yes, and you see all common special patterns are read. Yes. It's okay. okay, thank you. And uh, I just wonder, perhaps for the results to be practical, 
the latency should be minimized. So uh, have you wondered which way kind of is the fastest to process all of it? Uh, to 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 the the fastest. Uh, so, uh, for example, for for from my uh, pipeline, uh, convolution neural network worked uh, much faster than others model because uh, those uh, classical machine learning models required a bit of uh, uh, bit of uh, hyperparameter selection. So I, I couldn't use them just out of box. I had to find those parameters, and it, it, it takes time. And uh, for and this eGenet, it's a, I think it's a really good model. It's really fast and gives and gave me highest results. Want all? Okay, thank you. Do you have a question? A really quick question from Rust. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I have one question regarding the variability of the data within persons and uh, with the same subject person under different uh, conditions. Yes. So this, is, uh, this There must be very huge variability yes. in the data under different mental or other states. And how do you how do you take this? Uh, that's why approach? I had to perform all the experiments per subject. Uh, <laughs> because uh, yes, we have uh, so this EG community has uh, um, researches about uh, general models and generalization of EG signals, but uh, it's on earliest stage uh, for now, uh, and that's why uh, the common approach for EG just decoding and working on uh, da data re recorded from the uh, same subject with same condition. Okay. Thank you all. I I noticed that uh, there there were some more questions, but I propose to move them uh, to the coffee break, and uh, we can you can discuss in person with Alana. So thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you for questions. Yes, so uh, let me introduce the second uh, presenter of second question of the second day of the master uh, symposium. Uh, so Alexander Shevchenko, supervised by Alexei Pasichny, will be presenting a data-driven data recommendations for building energy retrofitting and urban scale. So, Alexander, the stage is yours. The best of luck. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm happy to be uh, the part of this master symposiums and want to present my master title proposal project with uh, topic data driving recommendations for building energy retrofitting and urban scale. Uh, this work advised by uh, Alexey Pasichny from uh, ATT uh, Royal Institute of Technology. Uh, the, my speech was structured as following. So we are going through introduction and motivation part, why retrofitting is uh, important and why I choose uh, this topic. Uh, the related work analysis and the test challenge, uh, what was used for uh, this research and the definition of the research problem, planet approaches, uh, short overview of data, and future work and conclusions. Uh, more than uh, 50 by 85% uh, of uh, European building stock were built before 2001 and uh, will be used still in 2050. Most of these buildings are energy inefficient and uh, there is a trend of constant growth in energy consumption in buildings. Uh, the question of decreasing the energy usage becomes a topical issue. And it's also important, important from the standpoint of planning uh, urban, uh, urban environments, cities, and uh, decreasing carbon emissions, energy usage. And uh, let's drive a bit deeper into this. Uh, as we can see in Europe, uh, over 35 percent of buildings are over 50 years old 
and uh, almost 75% of them uh, are energy inefficient. And uh, as a strategic solution for this, uh, in 2002, was adopted the energy performance of building uh, directive, which sets the framework for improving energy performance uh, in European building and uh, aiming to reduce energy consumption and CO2 emission. This directive was revised several times, and uh, we, each of these revisions introduced a new standards for new buildings and specifically for uh, old existing buildings, because all of most <laughs> most part of them will be still in use uh, 30 years after this. And so the later vision contains plans uh, up to 2050. One of the key points introduced in uh, EPBD was uh, energy performance certificate. It's a standardized way uh, of accessing and displaying energy efficiency of buildings uh, on sim simple scale, from A like most efficient to G the least uh, efficient. And uh, this energy performance certificate was designed to give owners, tenants, uh, buyers, uh, owners of building stocks, development companies, information about the energy performance of building and uh, in the very beginning, each country has its own methodic how to calculate uh, the energy performance and energy performance classes. But uh, now it's on the way to standardize this calculation and assigning uh, energy performance across the European Union. And uh, usually this calculation of uh, energy performance classes uh, requires a huge data collection about the building stock and it uh, used for modeling energy performance. As uh, we can see here, the implementing of the strategy proposed in uh, EPBD uh, and in the further revision has paid off. Household uh, energy efficiency has improved by about 29% uh, at the European uh, Union, uh, across the European Union level, between uh, 2000 and uh, 2019. Despite uh, the increasing of uh, number of buildings and appliances in the city, uh, the main driver of decreasing the energy consumption is uh, energy saving. So we can see here that in the same period of time, uh, we have more dwellings, more buildings, and uh, more consumptions, but uh, because of energy savings, it uh, provides us with a good uh, results. From the strategic point of view uh, in countries that uh, are not part of Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, According to projections, the energy consumed in buildings will grow more than 2% uh, percent per year. And uh, as we can see that putting efforts into energy efficiency on new and especially existing building stocks, uh, because most of them will be still used in 20, uh, 2050, uh, shows us a good result in uh, decreasing the uh, energy consumption. Uh, now let's uh, overview how energy retrofitting planning process uh, makes now works now, and this can we see the part of uh, systematic approach for building retrofitting, and specifically, uh, I want to review deeply and show you, put your attention on the part of choosing the retrofitting methods of possible retrofitting methods, and now it works in the way that. Uh, we identify the possible approaches, estimate or predict the impact for each of them for the specific building or across the building stock, and uh, validate the applicability or optimality of selected methods for the specific building, taking into account the limitations of the building, such as characteristics of building, 
implementation costs, impact of energy efficiency, and result of energy audit, usually as the last part. And uh, on a large scale, complexity of this process, if we're talking about city, city level, uh, district level, urban level, uh, increases significantly. Uh, data driving approaches uh, optimized this uh, way of manual retrofitting estimation process uh, from the time and cost standpoint. Uh, statistics or machine learning evaluation is much cheaper than uh, cheaper than manual audit, uh, and at the same time, such approaches have uh, drawbacks uh, because. Uh, one of them is that uh, retrofitting methods uh, are chosen by a uh, list of uh, available methods for the specific that supported by specific uh, models for energy consumption uh, evaluation, or from the predefined list, for example, from uh, the EPC data, and uh, this leads as a result to wide number of options to test uh, without the uh, real understanding of applicability for the specific building. Uh, and usually instead of evaluation of retrofitting results for the building, uh, in many studies happens evaluation of the uh, used uh, model uh, and its prediction of uh, energy performance. And uh, this uh, leads us to the addressed challenge of uh, my research uh, is to develop an approach to identify the retrofitting recommendations for buildings at urban scale using data-driven approaches and machine learning techniques without validation using building energy models. Uh, this way, we can mitigate uh, the mentioned drawbacks and uh, can reduce computational time and resources for energy simulation tools. Uh, during the background research and related work research uh, and analysis of the uh, existing studies, uh, the main founds uh, was that most of studies uh, selected to fit in measures from the uh, supported list or predefined list. And uh, the result uh, as we can see on schemes, uh, after applying some uh, energy performance simulation, we have prioritized retrofitting options that uh, choose from this predefined list, but uh, without real understanding of uh, building, character building characteristics and or, uh, applicability of these uh, features to this or that building in the stock. At uh, in urban scale, at urban scale, this leads us to two general recommendations that just cannot be applicable for uh, part of this uh, analyzed building stock, and uh, again, difficulties in development the energy models, energy performance models, uh, because they need to be too wide to analyze uh, a lot of uh, different building stocks, and uh, different uh, retrofitting options. Uh, and uh, after this analysis, the research gap was uh, identified as follows, that uh, the step of selecting the feasible uh, applicable retrofitting options for the specific buildings uh, or building stocks is commonly skipped or does not include the analysis of the building stock, but based on the computational and simulation simulational model characteristics and uh, possibilities. And uh, the research problem uh, is defined as follows. So uh, we need to identify recommendations based on already implemented or recommended retrofitting approaches for similar buildings in the investigated building stock. And as uh, approach solves this, which is a multi-label classification uh, and uh, clustering methods uh, and uh, without usage of uh, energy performance modeling approach. Uh, it's talking about approach for multi-label classification task. We will use the 
data uh, of energy performance certificates in Sweden. It's uh, data uh, that contains uh, building characteristics and information about uh, applied and uh, recommend uh, recommended recommendations. Uh, to reach the goal, uh, we will test the different multi-label classification methods and their ensembles, and uh, also additional hypotheses that we have that uh, applying extra clustering uh, for before the classification step may uh, improve uh, the results. Talking about uh, data, uh, the energy declarations data provided by Swedish National Board of housing and uh, originally data represented as uh, about 600 uh, of thousands uh, duplicated records with the same building information and different recommendation uh, sets for each building and uh, before we can start uh, this data had to be correctly measured pre-processed and after pre-processing we have approximately uh, 2,000, uh, 275,000 buildings, and uh, in total, 28 recommendation uh, classes that we uh, want to analyze. As most of real world data, uh, this one uh, also has its own peculiarities, and uh, data in Swedish and <laughs> the first work was to uh, translate all labels, categorical data, and uh, uh, without this, they almost cannot be persist, uh, proceed. And uh, as it's shown on the graph, uh, there are, we see this 28 uh, classes, and uh, they are pretty imbalanced. And it's one of the challenge how we uh, need to treat this. Uh, our data contains different subclasses, such as uh, one or two family houses or apartment buildings, and these classes cannot be mixed uh, from the retrofitting uh, recommendation standpoint, from a classification, uh, and uh, we have uh, to treat them independently as uh, subclasses. And uh, some of the features uh, just cannot be used for classification because they uh, biased by already implemented recommendations. Like if we already improved the hidden performance, we cannot uh, just remove this label and use this uh, information. Uh, talking about the future uh, steps, uh, uh, we need to find the optimal way to split the data in train test uh, sets, uh, taking, about, taking into account the uh, imbalance and labels and uh, uh, running experiments with different uh, multi-label classification techniques and tie the ensembles, validate the results, and validate our hypothesis that uh, clustering, additional clustering, uh, for example, for year or for uh, building square uh, will improve the classification result. And the conclusions uh, of my speech that for now we see that the uh, research problem is set, uh, goals and objectives for the research is established, and the data are already pre-processed. And I want to mention to also the potential impact of the suggested method, is that uh, this will allow to lower the cost uh, of identification uh, of targets for retrofitting at large scales. Uh, will decrease the will allow to decrease computational time and complexity in energy modeling uh, because we can choose a less amount of options to test and uh, definitely applicable uh, options and uh, also may be used for enriching existing data sets and uh, further research in researches uh, for building archetypes development and even can be part of the independent product uh, for providing information to building owners uh, for recommended uh, and applicable retrofitting options that they need to test firstly before, before the energy audit or something like that. Uh, finally, I would like to thank everyone 
who has helped me in this project and specifically my supervisor, uh, Alexey Pasichny. And that's it. Thank you for your time and I'm ready for your question. So as usual, let's start from the questions from the audience. Yeah, thank you for your talk. So I have a question regarding the uh, conclusion section. You have their uh, data pre-processed. And on the slide before, you're saying that you plan to make experiments with the ML model, and you're not stating what kind of ML model you will use. So my question is the next one. Like From my experience, different kinds of ML models, they require different kinds of pre-processing. So basically, you pre-processed it already, and you plan to apply some models, or like how it will okay. go. Uh, I, I got the question. So uh, it's uh, uh, what I meant that uh, the data in this uh, raw state uh, was uh, just uh, cannot be processed at all because they have a lot of duplicates, uh, a lot of uh, multiplications, and need to be pre-processed before uh, we have the like legible data set for further uh, usage for, uh, and apply this data set for different uh, type of uh, machine learning models or uh, approaches. And uh, I'm working on pipeline now for uh, translate this data set uh, and uh, like have a chance of data set transformers that can be applicable uh, due to the uh, tested model at the moment. I just not mentioned the result because it's not part, part part of the paper and it's not good. So so basically it's just like about the wording. Like I would change like the ah, preprocess okay. like to gather data set or something like this because preprocess like misleading to like other stuff. I agree, thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um yeah, so first of all. Do I understand correctly that um, as of now, this uh, recommendation is done manually and there is no uh, like baseline in the field or or am I wrong? Not at all. Uh, it uh, Usually this topic uh, has a, a pretty long history. Uh, originally it started in about 1950 and uh, it was done manually and statistical methods and uh, machine learning method applies and uh, there are a very general uh, diagram of current uh, approaches. Uh, applying the physical models. Physical models means that uh, using specific software that uh, takes uh, all detail, uh, very detailed model of the specific building, including heights, widths, floor uh, squares, uh, all physical parameters, and calculates the uh, energy performance or energy demand of this building, or uh, also machine learning approaches applied and statistical method applied. But uh, all of them uh, are in common that they use predefined retrofitting options. For example, this uh, software A uh, supply uh, 20 retrofitting options. And we did not, uh, usually it's not taken into account that uh, them are applied to this or that building, and we just test them all. And uh, spend the time and uh, time. And uh, when we use this on the large scale, for example, thousands of buildings, we receive some, uh, usually it were, uh, this uh, does in the way that uh, buildings are grouped into clusters or archetypes, uh, and each archetype has this uh, common character, some common characteristics, and we evaluate energy performance and get the prioritized set of fitting options for this kind of group of buildings, yeah? And, uh, but uh, they may be not applicable for these buildings because they are uh, calculated by the existing options list, not the mm -hmm. understandable. Thank you. My next question is about, is about uh, okay, so uh, this, uh, this uh, current approaches, what is their accuracy? Is there any baseline you could compare your approach to or 
Uh, no, I didn't find any existing bloodlines, but we have uh, data with... Uh, Uh, let me show this slide. So we have uh, already implemented uh, retrofitting options and uh, recommended retrofitting options. This data was done by uh, either audit uh, or a professional uh, expert of the building during the collection data for energy performance certificate. So the, our data is the energy officials Sweden stock energy performance certificate data. So this uh, our recommendations are our baseline. And we I need to. I see. So, it, in in other words, you say that your data set already includes the label ground truth labels. Yes. And then when you design this model, you run it and you calculate some yes. metric. Yes. Uh, and that metric, I assume, will be some multi-class classification metric, right? Yeah. Because as far as I recall, you didn't include any uh, metrics in your presentation. Um, okay. And would it be possible to apply those existing methods to this data set and to just for the comparison, or is it not? Technically, yes, uh, but I'm not sure that it uh, will show uh, any uh, good results because the way how we choose the fitting options is uh, constantly different. Yes, so but that could be a point, like that would be... Uh, a way to show that your your approach is much superior to others. That's why others should, I don't know, use your uh, approach. I, or I would say that we uh, not have a goal to beat them, uh, but help them, uh, help them to improve the, uh, the quality of their work. It's like a kind of uh, parallel uh, approach because it's uh, in the middle. We want to uh, improve the way how uh, retrofitting recommendations are chosen for further estimation and uh, but not the uh, way how the energy performance uh, calculated okay uh, thank you and the last one from my side is uh, the topic of your research is data driven recommendations for building energy retrofitting at urban scale and uh, so my question is about the word recommendations because as far as I understand, you do a multi, maybe multi, let's say multi-label or multi-class classification. And uh, so as far as I understand, as far as I understand uh, how you're going to recommend if yeah. say some point falls into one class, then you say, let's do this. If it falls into other class, you say, let's do that. What's, what is the recommendation part of your pipeline? Okay. Uh... It's probably uh, misleading. It's a common word uh, because in uh, energy performance certificates, this page specifically named as recommendation page. Uh, so uh, we uh, treat, we have 28 classes, uh, 28 like options of uh, possibly implemented recommendations or recommended, rec recommended recommendations uh, for retrofitting. So what need to be uh, improved or applied uh, in the building to improve the energy performance uh, or set up if it's some new ventilation system, for example. Yeah, and uh, we treat these uh, recommendation options as uh, binary labels. And when we uh, define the set of labels, we can like convert them back to a human understandable uh, list of recommendations that uh, we take from the APC data, and then we can provide the recommendations. But uh, I will think about how to treat this misleading correctly. Uh, just to elaborate on the second last question by Ruslan, uh, to understand understood you did understood you understand you correctly that uh, these energy performance certificates that you mentioned somewhere at the beginning are elaborated based on the measurements on uh, these 27 features? Uh, they, uh, the energy performance data uh, contains uh, information about building stock, mm -hmm. uh, physical characteristics, uh, uh, consumption characteristics, and uh, for example, number of floors, uh, squares, and so on. And uh, also contains information about uh, 
already implemented retrofitting options to uh, improve the energy consumption uh, or uh, recommended options to improve it. So it's okay. kind of, let's say, official, it's not surveys, uh, official. Uh, so, so on one hand, do you have this data on um, 275,000 uh, Swedish buildings. Uh, the raw data contain this retrofitting analysis, retrofitting uh, fitting achievements per building. Uh, to have the information about the certificates for those it's, for the same buildings, this is information of, uh, of certificate. Uh, don't you think that uh, an energy uh, performance certificate could be regarded as a sort of uh, metric? Of uh, to measure the uh, the success in uh, enabling the uh, energy performance for a building. Uh, I'm I'm just going further uh, while you are thinking. Uh, I think based on this uh, detailed information collected in the data set, you may generate uh, the certificates. Uh, you, uh... Based on the analysis of the retrofitting uh, options that you are going to do through the machine learning approach. Yeah. I... So you may classify those portions of data which uh, are fed into the network using uh, this uh, multi-class classification from A to F. And then compare to the original energy certificates, which would be the ground truth, as, as I believe. Is it correct? Uh, not at all. Uh, you okay. see that uh, energy performance certificates already contain this table as, a, uh, as an energy uh, class, you're right, from A to G. And uh, also they contain the uh, recommendations, what we can improve in the building to uh, get the more efficient uh, uh, state of this building. And uh, uh, the specific goal of our research is not to predict the classes, but uh, we focus specifically on retrofitting options. Uh, so uh, yes, we can do this. Uh, it's like it's one of the possible options to predict the uh, energy classes, but it's not uh, like really feasible in the real world because okay, uh, for example, if you are building owner and you know that your building class is B but you still don't know how to reach the A. And uh, what we are focusing that we uh, providing you a short list of options, like sh sh shorter list of options, uh, what you can test with uh, more specific models or with auditor to uh, reach that kind of next class or just improve. Let's see, we need to improve the building energy performance. So did, did I understand you correctly that it's rather not a classification, but uh, text generation for uh, for the recommendations based on the oh, ret retrofitting options which are recommended? It's classification problem, but uh, we uh, choose as class not the energy performance class, but retrofitting options. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alexander. And uh, the next speaker in uh, this slot is Ulana Zbazhovska, uh, supervised by Alexander Hapilin. And she will be presenting a project entitled uh, Exploring Challenges and Future Passes in Deepfake Audio Detection. Lana, do you need any help to set up this?
Before we are preparing for the next talk, I would like to let you know about the comment in the chat by Alexey Pasichny. Uh, he, has, he has just written that there is no value in predicting EPC label per se. It's just, it just reflects the current performance. The value comes in understanding the type of buildings the building belongs to, and through this, fetching the relevant recommendations. So this is exactly in, um, in support of what you have said in the answer. Thank you very much. Yes, please, Ulyana, the best of luck. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ulyana Zbyshkowska. Uh, I'm the first uh, author of the position paper presenting our project. Uh, the project is focusing uh, on exploring challenges and future paths uh, in deepfake audio detection. Uh, Alexander Hapilin uh, advises this work. Uh, the paper uh, describing this work is uh, presented uh, on the slide uh, and is uh, currently in press. Uh, sorry. Uh, the plan uh, of uh, my talk uh, is uh, uh, as follows. Uh, I will begin uh, by informing you. Sorry. Uh, I will begin by informing you about spheres of using deepfake uh, audio in both positive and negative ways. Uh, then I plan to uh, explore uh, exi existing methods uh, of detecting them uh, and observe the data sets with deepfake audio uh, and metrics to uh, evaluate uh, the deepfake uh, audio, audio detection models. Uh, based on that, uh, I will define uh, the aim of research uh, and the questions that uh, need to be answered. Uh, further, uh, I will focus on possible solutions for improving the generalization capabilities of deepfake audio detection models uh, and show uh, earlier results. Uh, at the end, uh, I will give some conclusive remarks uh, and define uh, future work. Uh, deepfake uh, audio has a uh, um has a transformative potential in entertainment, uh, enabling a seamless dubbing and voice acting, uh, and in assisti uh, assistive technology, enhancing uh, communication uh, device usability for individuals with uh, speech uh, challenges. Uh, however, the technology uh, also poses serious uh, threats, uh, such as uh, misinformation uh, and, uh, ident uh, and identity uh, threats uh, or uh, create uh, comprom uh, compromising uh, or incriminating recordings of individuals which can then be used for uh, blackmail uh, or uh, extortion purposes. Uh, all these dangers highlight uh, the need for robust machine learning uh, countermeasures. Uh, existing mainstream studies uh, on uh, audio deepfake detection can be broadly categorized uh, into two types of solutions. Uh, first is pi pipeline solutions, uh, and the second is end-to-end uh, -end detectors. Uh, the pipeline approaches uh, involve uh, a two-step process uh, with a front uh, and future uh, extractor uh, capturing uh, relevant uh, audio features and a uh, uh, back-end classifier making the final uh, detection decision. Uh, on the other hand, end-to-end uh, -end detectors uh, aim to learn the uh, detection task uh, in a single step, uh, leveraging deep neural, ne neural networks uh, to map raw audio uh, the data uh, directly to the uh, detection decision. Uh, recent advancements uh, in this area include uh, integrated pre-trained models like uh, love to vec uh, Huber or Whisper, into future instruction models, uh, and uh, utilizing uh, various uh, deep learning algorithms such as CNN, uh, ResNet, uh, uh, GNN, uh, and others uh, for back and classification, uh, showcasing the uh, adaptive adaptability and robustness of deep learning in deepfake audio detection. Uh, machine learning algorithms' ability to distinguish uh, a real and fake audio relies on diverse uh, 
real life uh, training da data. Uh, early uh, data set were crucial for developing a countermeasure for uh, automatic speaker verification system, uh, enhancing security measures. Uh, the US the spoofs uh, challenge has uh, further uh, advanced uh, as uh, as the technology focusing on uh, detecting various types of attack uh, attacks, including uh, deep fakes. However, these data sets uh, lack a real-world scenario representation uh, impacting model performance. Uh, to address uh, this, uh, researchers have collected uh, an in the wild data set in real-world uh, conditions, uh, compromising uh, audio deepfake uh, for public uh, figures uh, and uh, politicians. Uh, additionally, other um, data sets like the fake or real uh, data set and the fake uh, have uh, been developed, uh, each with its advantages and limitations uh, shown uh, on the slide. Uh, to observe the difference in real and fake audios uh, of described data set, uh, figure one uh, presents the mass spectrograms uh, of one of them uh, in the wild. Uh, as we uh, can see, fake uh, audio cannot uh, reproduce the detailed uh, structures uh, that are close uh, to those uh, in the real uh, audio mass spectrograms. Uh, thus, uh, in this research, we aim to leverage insights from uh, this data set uh, to comprehensively evaluate the deep learning models, uh, generalization capabilities for detecting uh, fake audio, uh, enhancing uh, model robustness against evolving audio uh, deep fake threats. Uh, to evaluate the performance of deepfake audio classifiers, we plan to use uh, an equal error rate uh, metric, which uh, is uh, defined uh, as an error rate at a particular special operating point uh, at which the pulse alarm uh, and miss rates are equal. Uh, it is independent for decision costs uh, and uh, does not uh, necessitate the predetermined settings of detection uh, thresholds. Uh, taking, uh, taking into account the current state of deep fake uh, uh, audio detection field, uh, we can say that the ASVA spoof 2021 uh, dataset is uh, uh, central to deep fake audio detection with uh, RAVNET 2 emerging as a leading model. Uh, however, uh, RAVNET 2's uh, limitation in generalization beyond control dataset raise concerns about its uh, reliability in real world uh, scenarios. Uh, understanding uh, RAVNET's two details uh, and enhancing its generalization capabilities are crucial next steps uh, in improving uh, deep fake audio detection. Uh, to do this, it's necessary to answer the next question. Uh, first, it, uh, what are specific aspects of RAVNET 2 uh, architecture uh, can uh, contribute to, it, uh, uh, to its suboptimal uh, generalization uh, on diverse data sets? Uh, how do different feature extraction uh, techniques uh, in the first layer uh, of RAVNET 2 impact the model's uh, accuracy and generalization capabilities? And third question uh, is, uh, how, uh, can alternative neural uh, network architectures uh, be identified to improve the accuracy of deepfake uh, audio detection on both uh, as well spoof evaluation data uh, and the dataset obtained in the wild? Uh, now, considering motivation and research goal, I want to present uh, the early results of my work. Uh, uh, as uh, was said earlier, one of the most uh, promising baseline models for, uh, from ICVS Poop if is RAVNET 2. Uh, its architecture is illustrated uh, in Figure 2. Uh, RAVNET 2 is a fully end to end system uh, that operates directly uh, on raw uh, audio waveforms. Uh, as a feature a structure, uh, a structure uh, layer, it uh, uses synconf uh, filters with uh, different uh, resolutions. However, due to its de uh, design, the synconf layer can be limited in capturing all small scale features. Uh, it operates uh, as a bandpass filter with a fixed time frequency resolution, uh, which may not uh, fully capture the nuanced characteristics of spoofed uh, audio signals. Uh, this limitation uh, could potentially impact the model's uh, ability to uh, distinguish uh, subtle uh, differences between bona fide and spoof uh, audio. Uh, to address this issue, um, a potential avenue 
for improvement involves exploring alternative uh, future structure uh, levels. Uh, currently, as a model relies on SynConf with 20 filters for its purpose, uh, one approach uh, to optimize it is is to vary the number of filters uh, in the SynConf uh, layer. Uh, additionally, it is crucial to experiment with uh, diverse techniques for extracting features uh, from uh, audio signals uh, to ascertain their impact uh, on the model performance. For example, for this, is, it can be used uh, the encoder output from automatic speech recognition systems. Uh, like uh, Whisper, a uh, model uh, trained on multilingual uh, and multitasking, uh, such as uh, motion and scene recognition, uh, supervised uh, data collected from the web. Uh, Huber uh, learns both acoustic and language model for, from continuous inputs. Uh, to work 2 uh, the model is trained to predict uh, the current, uh, the correct speech unit uh, for masked parts uh, of the audio. Uh, while uh, at the same time uh, learning what the speech uh, unit should be uh, and uh, uh, work 2 XLSR the same as work 2 uh, but trained on multilingual uh, data. Uh, some characteristics uh, of, it, uh, of this method uh, are presented uh, on the slide. Uh, we plan to test uh, all this method as the first uh, layer of uh, RAV2 to uh, ascertain their impact uh, on the model performance. Uh, the slide shows the table uh, that was designed to provide a co comprehensive overview of how the model performance varies when uh, utilizing uh, different techniques for feature extraction. As the first column represents the result of the original architecture RAVNet 2 with 20 syncall filters. Uh, other columns show the differences in equal error rates between the original model and the model with all proposed VH extraction layers, where plus indicates worse results and minus better. Uh, also, both numbers indicate the best results for each uh, dataset. Uh, the first find is that uh, uh, all suggested approaches uh, demonstrate superior performance uh, compared to the original uh, RAVNET 2 uh, designed across uh, in the wild uh, and uh, way fake uh, datasets. Uh, second find within the context of the fake or real dataset, uh, only RAVNET 2 paired with Whisper uh, surprises the original uh, architecture. Uh, also, Whisper is uh, possessing uh, the most robust generalization uh, capabilis capabilities, consistently uh, outperforming the original uh, model uh, across uh, all data sets, except uh, RSV spoof, where it uh, lacks uh, by less than 1%. Uh, percent. Uh, the third point uh, is that uh, in the context of uh, in the wild uh, and by fake data set, uh, well, for, uh, to work to show the best uh, generalization capabilities. Uh, to sum up, uh, this study provides a uh, thorough uh, explo uh, exploration uh, of uh, feature extraction uh, configuration of the RAVNET 2 model, uh, incorporation uh, variations in the number of filters in the SYNCONV layer, uh, and experimenting with a diverse uh, technique. Uh, as uh, we saw that Whisper demonstrates, uh, demonstrates exceptional generalization abilities, uh, consistently surprising the baseline model in all uh, datasets except the uh, ISV spoof, where its uh, performance lacks uh, by less than one person. Uh, additionally, it should be noted that the world to work to demonstrate superior uh, generalization capabilities within the in the wild and way fake datasets. Uh, however, limitations uh, uh, arise notably a higher equal error rate uh, on the uh, fake or real data set. Uh, future work will focus on exploring uh, another possible feature extraction technique to improve the performance of uh, deepfake uh, audio detection models uh, and, uh, 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 and in find uh, alternative deep learning networks for uh, deepfake audio detection, uh, including computer vision with models like YOLO, to investigate their potential, uh, potential in audio uh, analysis uh, tasks. Uh, thank you for your attention.
Okay, uh, we have a uh, hand raised. Uh, let's this time start from Alexander, not Ihor. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Atlo. Uh, so, first of all, for a nice presentation and very interesting topic here. So, I'm very wondering, uh, maybe you have some intuition about why Whisper outperforms other other approaches. Uh, mostly because Whisper is about uh, uh, the mostly the content of the speech, not about the voice itself, but others uh, are more considerate about the voice, how it sounds. Uh, maybe uh, first my intuition is uh, it's multilingual uh, model. No, I don't know is it uh, no is it uh, relies on this or, or not. Uh, and second, that uh, as I remember, it requires thirty seconds of uh, audio uh, as input. Uh, and uh, in my data set, I have only uh, two three seconds recording. And to, to train this model, uh, I only. Uh, copies uh, one audio and can concatenate it to, to uh, receive 30 seconds and uh, I don't know maybe uh, because of this. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a few questions. So the first one, uh, could you please go with the slide with the training data? Like where you have the smell spectrograms. So, yeah, this one. This? No, no, next one. Yeah. So, you have here like uh, high amplitude uh, characteristics like that are, that are similar. And you have the, like, the, lo the low one, uh, that black one on the fake. Like you have not full spectrum, basically. Uh, not all components in the spectrum presented in the fake data, while in the real, the the, the, br the width I of understand. the... Yeah, so my question is the next one. If we will inject in the fake data uh, similar patterns, like noisy ones as the background, uh, how our approach will perform? So basically you're saying that we have different difference in the male spectrogram and this difference uh, as I can see like with my eye is... I, I, I understand. Yeah, so... Uh, my answer, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, during the uh, literature review, I found one uh, article. Uh, it uh, The name was uh, like uh, about silence uh, and uh, it told uh, that uh, uh, deep... Uh, uh, models that form uh, deep fake audio uh, are very bad uh, in perform uh, in uh, generate noises uh, in in copy noises uh, and uh, um, that is why as we uh, can see here uh, it uh, not uh, it not generated so we can say that uh, all this uh, black uh, holes uh, in the picture uh, it may be uh, <laughs> I, I meant to say that we could just inject that noise manually like, uh, yes, to, we can. to overcome this, like... Uh, yes, we can, but uh, I have only uh, two, three seconds of audio and uh, it's uh, uh, very hard to inject uh, such small uh, pieces uh, of noises from uh, such audios. Okay, got it. So, uh, one more question here. Uh, so, you have, like, multiple data sets uh, of deep fake audios. Probably most of them contains different uh, methods of deep fake generation. Uh, you fine tune for each of them and you measure the performance. Uh, no, I train uh, on all of them. Uh, no, I train all my models only on ISFS pool data uh, to see how it how model will perform on uh, on scene data, and for this I used uh, all three others. Uh, data okay, so the validation one, like test set, is in the wild, fake or real, or awake fake. Yes. Okay, so basically they're out of domain. Okay, that's cool. Uh, and the last question would be: uh, This could you please go to the slide with the metrics with the, with table. Okay, here. So uh, for the wake fade data set, if we see the syncconf 
uh, 10 filters, uh, sync on 30 filters and 40 filters. We have like... Uh, Better performance? Yeah, like we have minus like uh, linear, maybe, maybe like linear dependency in numbers. But if we go for real or fake, we have like... like the actually no in the wild you we have not linear and why the sync conf for 30 filters we have like that such outlier what the motivation here what do you think like for the wake wake fake we have uh we have the linear for the fake or real we have also like more or less behavior uh, thank you for the question it's maybe a very hard question because uh, <laughs> data in each data set uh, uh... Uh, really different uh, they um, obtained in different um, conditions uh, and uh, <laughs> I exactly uh, at this time don't uh, take it uh, into account account but I will think about this yeah it's it's the good thing to think because the rest one like you have 10 30 40, 40 filters you, you have like dependency in the size and if we go with like deep learning neural networks we have like dependency in the filter size like the more probably better more parameters and here we have like something strange i think we should uh, go deeper in uh, analyzing data sets uh, uh, because uh, for example our spoof uh, it uh, have a, a huge evaluation data with its own uh, data that uh, wasn't used during training uh, and uh, maybe here some find some findings about why why we get so results okay thank you a lot thank you Can you consider, consider to also investigate the uh, malfrequency frequency spectral coefficients as a replacement for the scene convo? So, I, I understand uh, uh, currently no. no. Uh, okay, so uh, I also would like to maybe in offline to understand the motivation of using the scene conf and, may, uh, and uh, do not use, for example, other techniques like wavelet transformer, etc. Uh, I plan it to use uh, in my... Oh, I can show all of my early results in this presentation, but uh, about wavelet transforms, I uh, currently use it uh, and uh, also some other types of uh, models to find uh, models with um, the best generalization capabilities uh, about uh, coefficients that you mentioned uh, I don't plan uh, plan to use it uh, but uh, it uh, may be interesting uh, but also there are many other techniques uh, to do this uh, and uh, I don't have much time <laughs> to, to check all of them Good. thank you um. Uh, okay, so uh, one more question from my side. Uh, do I understand correctly that you uh, change uh, the feature extraction layers and then train the model uh, from, from scratch? Right? Yes, the same model, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, like for how many, do I understand correctly also that you train for the same number of epochs Yes. Uh, uh, all the hyperparameters are the same. The, yes. Mm -hmm. mm, and uh, it would be also interesting to see, I don't know, the training curves, the loss or something like that, uh, just to give the, in just to have the intuition, not only the final matrix. Okay. okay. Uh, I think uh, this, this answered my questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ulana. So uh, this session, this slot is over, and uh, uh, we have a one-hour uh, slot reserved for uh, dinner or lunch, whatever. Uh, uh, yes. So just uh, <laughs> just enjoy your meal, and please come back in one hour for the next presentations. Thank you.